So we're just starting back up now again. So welcome to all of you online, here in person. We're, we're glad that you are here. My name is Marika, and I'm looking forward to leading you in worship today. I'm joined with Amanda and Jeremy Rambo, and also we're very glad to have Pastor Leslie joining us. And uh, Pastor Leslie is bringing us the word today, and I'm very glad that she has also joined us uh, in singing here from the front and leading us all in worship. A uh, few announcements. Uh, Council is going to have a barbecue at the end of this week on Friday here in, out in front of the church. So just thought uh, it's nice for everyone to know and a reminder for those of you that are part of the leadership of this church that that barbecue will take place. Um, also, just so everyone knows, the uh, ministry leaders are meeting and figuring out what things will look like this fall um, with just gathering together again, either in person or online for their ministries. And um, also, uh, this weekend, it happens every year that several families will go and camp together at the Pinery. And uh, that was able to happen again this year, so um, we're, we're missing a few faces uh, today that are there camping. I think that was all of my announcements. So uh, I want to just uh, pass things over to Leslie for the blessing, and then uh, I'll start with a call to worship. Would you please stand to receive God's blessing? Or if you're online, raise your hearts with us. Greetings, grace, peace, and mercy to you from God our Father and from Christ Jesus the Son. And all God's people everywhere said, Amen. So our call to worship this morning comes from Psalm 147. Praise the Lord. How good it is to sing praises to our God. How pleasant and fitting to praise him. The Lord builds up Jerusalem. He gathers the exiles of Israel. He heals the brokenhearted and binds up their wounds. He determines the number of the stars, and he calls them each by name. Great is our Lord and mighty in power. His understanding has no limit. The Lord sustains the humble, but casts the wicked to the ground. Sing to the Lord with grateful praise. Make music to our God on the harp. He covers the sky with clouds. He supplies the earth with rain and makes grass grow on the hills. He provides food for the cattle and for the young ravens when they call. Now listen carefully here. I found this really interesting reading this. His pleasure is not in the strength of the horse, nor his delight in the legs of the warrior. The Lord delights in those who fear him, who put their hope in his unfailing love. Now I know as I read that call to worship from Psalm 147 mentions the word sing. And I know during this time we're refraining from singing here in this building but I do believe that we can sing in, in many different ways. Uh, we can sing with our hearts. We can sing with our hands. Um, so just join us in worship um, how God leads you to. And uh, we will start with our uh, first song of praise, Hosanna, Praise is Rising.
week, I was uh, privileged to be able to bring Psalm 51 to you. And we're going to be looking at Psalm 32 today. So we've been sitting kind of in confession and forgiveness and what that means and how that can be grace to God's people. So I'd like to uh, pray a prayer of confession. And then we're going to hear God's invitation to us to receive the living water that he promises when we confess to him. So would you join your hearts in prayer with me? Heavenly Father, we, we're overwhelmed by your goodness. We're overwhelmed by your goodness that we see in Jesus. We're overwhelmed by your goodness in the midst of pandemic. We're overwhelmed by your goodness even if many of us are walking through the valley of the shadow right now. God, we ask that you would forgiveness, forgive us when we don't recognize your presence in the valley, when we don't recognize your presence in this uh, stretching time. Forgive us when we are short-tempered because things don't quite go the way we would like them to go because we feel like we're living in the middle of chaos. Forgive us when we strike out against people out of our frustration, out of our fear, out of our worry and anxiety. Forgive us when we listen to the whisper that you have abandoned us during this time. Father, forgive us for the things that we have said and left unsaid, did and left undone. Forgive us when we don't treat our neighbor in a way that honors them and shows them your love. Forgive us when we mistreat your earth and the people who inhabit it. Forgive us, God, when we say we don't have enough energy to deal with the pain and agony outside of our own homes. Forgive us when we resist your grace. Every one of those things we ask and all the, the deep things that are within our hearts, we know you see, you hear, you listen. And you do indeed forgive because of the work of your son, Jesus, on the cross. And for that, we thank you. We thank you. We pray all of these things in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. So here is what we hear from Isaiah 55. Come, all you who are thirsty, come to the waters. And you who have no money, come buy and eat. Come, buy wine and milk without money and without cost. Why spend money on what is not bread and your labor on what does not satisfy? Listen, listen to me and eat what is good and you will delight in the richest affair. Give ear and come to me. Listen that you may live. I will make an everlasting covenant with you, my faithful love promised to David. See, I have made him a witness to the peoples, a ruler and commander of the peoples. Surely you will summon nations you do not, and nations you do not know will come running to you. Why? Because of the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, for he has endowed you with splendor. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call on him while he is near. Thanks be to God. Let's respond now with uh, singing the song, How Great Thou Art. And I caught myself there, I said singing. But um, in the chorus it says, then sings my soul. And my prayer for all of us is that our souls will sing as we um, join together in this song. me hey. 
stars, I hear the mighty thunder, thy power throughout the universe display. Then sings my soul, my Savior God to thee, how great thou art, how great thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior God to thee. that are joining us online as Amy would always say come get close up to the TV or whatever you're watching this on and uh, Pastor Leslie will be bringing us to children's moments and then we have a fun song afterwards to do together so I know that you always greet each other the Lord be with you and we respond and also with you I brought you one of my favorite books. It's called Thoughts to Make Your Heart Sing. And the reason it's one of my favorite books is it gives me all sorts of things to think about, about God and how he loves us and how he takes care of his world. And the one I wanna share today is called Three Small Words. And it goes very well with the sermon today. So I want you to think about three small words. Our scripture for this story comes from Deuteronomy 11:18. Therefore, these words of mine, in your heart and in your soul, hide them, treasure them. What words does God want you to treasure in the deepest part of you? Are they be good, or do it better, or try harder? Are those the words God wrote in the Bible for us to rescue and free us? No. Those words only show us what we can't do. The words God wants us to remember are just three small words. Can you guess them? I love you. I love you. They are the words that stop the terrible lie that Satan whispered to Eve in the garden. God doesn't love you. They are the words that heal the poison in our hearts that stops us from trusting God. They are the words that Jesus came to tell us with his 
whole life. I love you. They are the words he died to prove. Children, and those of us who are young at heart, what words will you treasure today? I'd like to say a prayer over our young people. God, may the youngest among us and the oldest among us know those words in a deep, rich way. May the actions of this community constantly and consistently say, God loves you. We love you. Children who are listening today, children who are heading off to school, heading off to things that may seem a little bit scary, unknown, treasure these words in your heart from Jesus and this, your community. I love you you, says God through his son Jesus. Amen. So please stand and uh, the song we're going to sing, or the song we're going to sing, oh, is Jesus Loves Me, This I Know, but there's some actions involved in it, so please stand, please clap along. Amanda's going to help us with the clapping. And there's uh, some haze, so you can shout out some of those haze. Um, so yeah, let's uh, start on and try out this song. Later on, we will have opportunity to listen to God speak to us through the words through Leslie. But now we have an opportunity to talk to God ourselves, all our hopes and dreams. So let us prepare our hearts as we speak with God. Heavenly Father, we come to you today with thankfulness that you have claimed us as your children. And we thank you for your love. 
We celebrate the resurrection of Jesus. And because of that, we can sing praises to you. Help us realize that this is something we should celebrate every day. We thank you for the promise of our redemption because of this. Let us be aware that we do not belong to ourselves, but we, we belong to you. As we continue to have our lives affected by coronavirus, please let us be mindful of your presence. We pray f for all of our government leaders as they make decisions for steps to take with the pandemic. And as we watch the news, we see the world is groaning with difficulties and it pricks our hearts. So we look for comfort and assurance from you. Please calm our stress. Let us realize that you are still in control and give us the patience as we wait for relief from this situation. In our church family, there are some who are not well. We pray that you be with Faith Schulker and with her husband, Mike, as they have some health struggles. And be with all those others who are having health issues. We pray for comfort for those who mourn loss of loved ones. And yet there are others who struggle with addiction and depression. This affects more than those who are addicted and depressed but those who love them and we ask for guidance and the right tools to be your voice to help them and we continue to pray for our seniors we make special mention of the shut-ins let them realize that they are loved by you and not forgotten and we pray for our youth and children let them have a daily walk with you in this time of uncertainty Please give them the assurance that you are the solid rock to cling to. And we ask for blessings upon the different ministries we are involved with. Be with the leaders of our church as they seek wisdom for ways to open our church to all of us and to the community. And we pray that you be with Pastor Dave. We also pray that you be with Amy as she moves to British Columbia to do kingdom work there, give her safety as she makes this transition. Many members are camping this weekend. Please bless the communion they are experiencing and give them all them safety. This morning we lift Pastor Leslie to you and ask that you be with her as she gives her message to us this morning. Let her words be in of encouragement for us. Help us to reach to you as we seek forgiveness for living without acknowledging you. Again, we ask that you be with this congregation as we seek to discern our place in your kingdom. Bless the work that you have asked us to do. Let us be your servants. Help us to be a beacon to the community to Water Street community and Guelph. With your help, Lord, we seek to be ambassadors of reconciliation. We seek to speak and live with grace and truth in a world with many needs. We pray for ongoing racial tensions in our nation and around the world. Pray that the justice and peace will embrace and that Christ's Holy Spirit would work in the hearts of those who foment division. Let us be mindful of your presence. Remind us that you are with us in all circumstances. As we continue to distance ourselves in person, please help us experience the communion of the church. Give us patience as we wait for answers to our prayers. And we are thankful that you have a great plan for us and we look for comfort from you. And we lift this prayer to you with confidence and thankfulness that you do hear our prayers and that you are with us at all times. As you have blessed us,
Please make us a blessing to others. In the name of Jesus, who paid the price for our sins, we pray. Amen. And it's so good to be with you. It's, uh, yeah, wonderful to see familiar eyes, if not whole faces. For me, it's like coming home to family. We are going to be looking at Psalm 32. Last week, we looked at Psalm 51. And this is a great companion to what we thought about last week. Psalm 32, a psalm of David. Blessed is the one whose transgressions are forgiven, whose sins are covered. Blessed is the one whose sin the Lord does not count against them and in whose spirit is no deceit. When I kept silent, my bones wasted away through my groaning all day long. For day and night your hand was heavy on me. My strength was sapped as in the heat of summer. But then I acknowledged my sin to you and did not cover up my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord. And you forgave the guilt of my sin. Therefore, let all the faithful pray to you while, they may be found, while you may be found. Surely the rising of the mighty waters will not reach them. You are my hiding place. You will protect me from trouble and surround me with songs of deliverance. I will instruct you and teach you in the way you should go. I will counsel you with my loving eye on you. Do not be like the horse or the mule, which have no understanding, but must be controlled by bit and bridle, or they will not come to you. Many are the woes of the wicked, but the Lord's unfailing love surrounds the one who trusts in him. Rejoice in the Lord and be glad, you righteous. Sing, all you who are upright in heart. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So this is a, an interesting psalm. It's part of the penitential psalms. It's a call to confession, but it's also a testimony about what happens when we confess our sins to God. And it's a study in deep contrasts, what, we do, what happens to us when we don't confess our sins to God. And just like last week with Psalm 51, this psalm is attributed to David as well. But we must remember both the David of Psalm 51 of last week, the one who had to have a prophet come and remind him that he had been sinning against God, against his people, against Bathsheba, against Uriah. He had to be reminded of that. But there is also another David that this is attributed to. That joyful David from 1 Samuel 6. Do you remember that David when the Ark of the Covenant is finally brought back to the people of Israel? And what does he do? He dances. He dances with joy in front of that Ark because all things are made right with God again. That David is also a singer of this song. And we need to remember as well that devoted David from Acts 13 a man after God's own heart. God even recognized that in David himself. A sinner and yet a man after God's own heart. We're complex beings, aren't we? <laughs> We're not just one thing. We change day to day sometimes in our relationship with God. And all of this is what we should think about when we think of this Psalm of David. And when I listen to this psalm, I hear the psalmist saying these things. Here's a truth about my own experience with God. Here's what happened to me when I didn't confess. And here's what happened when I did. Here's how my life changed. So let's follow that through the psalm together, shall we? The psalmist says, here's a truth from my own experience with God. Back in Psalm 51, in verse 13, David says, the psalmist says, I will teach transgressors your ways. 
I think that's what Psalm 32 is. I'm going to teach you, those of you who are dealing with sin, unspoken sin, unrecognized sin, I'm going to tell you what happens when you keep it in and when you let it go. So let's start with the good news the psalmist says. God's character, which we learned about last week, is one of justice and faithfulness and love. And so when we confess our sins, he will be faithful and just because that's who he is and he will forgive us. That's the good news. And once you've gone through the process of forgiveness and hearing the words, you are forgiven, you will once again experience the joy of the Lord, the joy of your salvation. And that's what it means to be truly happy and blessed. The world will tell us that happiness is in all sorts of other things. Isn't that true? Things, really things. Get a better car, get a better house, get more clothes, add more stuff, go on more vacations. That's what the world tells us is happiness. And the psalmist says, no, you're missing the boat there. You're missing the boat. The joy of your salvation is in hearing the words, you are forgiven, you are mine, you are loved. We're all right again with each other. Happy are those who have been reconciled and returned to right relationship with their creator God. That's the truth and the good news from this psalmist's experience. He says, I'm not making this up. I experienced it myself in real time. And then he says, if you don't believe me, I'm going to tell you another story. Here's what happened when I didn't confess, when I kept silent when I tried to hide or deny or push down my guilt and shame, God wouldn't let me go. He sent me a prophet, Nathan, to tell me a story about somebody who was stealing lambs from a widow. And I got so angry at that that robber. I said, we've got to do something about him. And what did Nathan say? That robber is you. You're the one who has to make it right to me and to your people, to God and to your people. When I kept silent, I experienced the exact opposite of joy. And what does this silence look like or feel like? The songwriter says, well, it's unbearable. It's like an unbearable weight bearing down on me. It's almost physically painful when I push off and deny that I need to get right with God. The psalmist says, I hardly had the will or the energy to live. What an incredible contrast from the joy he talks about, the joy of his salvation to when he is far from God. He can barely cope. He says, there's the joy and there's the abyss. And this is the abyss. That hand that I always thought was carrying me, that hand that became my shelter, that hand that lovingly guided me now became a weight. It no longer lifted me. It bore down heavily upon me. I experienced God not as a shelter, but something or someone almost suffocating me. I couldn't breathe. That's what happens when we hide our sin and we don't confess. So we have to ask ourselves, why would we wait? Why would we knowingly go into a situation like that where we would feel that heaviness, that burden, that slowness, that lack of will to live in our own lives. Why might we wait to confess? But I think it's our human nature, it's our broken nature. We tend to put off what we don't want to do or we think we don't need to do. About two and a half years ago, I had terrible sciatica. But I said to myself, self, Just adjust the way you walk and you'll be fine. So I kind of dragged this leg around and kind of did one of these things. It got to be so bad that when I had to preach at Meadowvale, um, I could barely get out of the car. I walked in and I had to lay down on the floor during praise team practice and they're like, this will be interesting. Finally, someone there kind of helped stretch me out and I had to preach from a chair. That's how much pain I was in. And you say, well, Leslie, What is wrong with you? Why didn't you go to the doctor? And I thought, well, it'll go away. It'll go away. 
By the time I went to the doctor and then to the physio, guess what all else was hurting? I had some hip issues. I had a knee issue. My foot was bothering me. Why? Because I waited. And I'm seeing heads nod out there. I think I'm not the only one who waits until it's almost too late and we have all this residual pain. I think we do that in our spiritual lives as well. I think we wait because either we're so fixated on trying to fix the sin ourselves, we're so enmeshed in it that we think, well, I've said a lie here, so if I say a lie over here, this lie will go away, and we find ourselves getting dug in more and more, hurting more and more ourselves and the people around us, and getting further and further away from the one who loves us. Or we deny it, right? It's not really there. It's not that bad. We minimize, actually. You know, at least I didn't kill anyone. At least I didn't rob anyone. I may have robbed somebody of their dignity the way I spoke to them, but it's not as bad as what it could have been. And so we put off bringing it to the Lord. And we hide. Sometimes I think it's because we just hide. We don't want to deal with it. We're ashamed. I wonder if sometimes the reason that we put off bringing our sin to the Lord, confessing, is that we may actually be struggling with guilt versus shame. And the heaviness comes in when we live into shame as being our only story. You know, shame is that unpleasant, self-conscious emotion that makes us withdrawal. I don't want anyone to look at me. I especially don't want God to look at me. I don't want to be exposed. I don't trust anybody would be able to look at me and still love me after this. And so we feel powerless and we feel worthless. Guilt is I did something bad. Shame is, I am someone bad. I'm irredeemable. Guilt fits more into the world's economy. I hit you, you hit me back. I say something ugly to you, you say something ugly back. Or I say I'm sorry. I remember when our girls were little, we tried very hard to say, Anna, you just stole Allie's doll. You say you're sorry. Sorry. You're sorry for what? For taking your doll. And what else? For making you feel bad. But then what was the other part of the equation there? You are forgiven. Otherwise, Allie gets it in her head that she's just not a very nice girl to play with. Right? Many of us lived in shame cultures, shame cultures that said, well, you know, I forgive you for doing that thing, but I'm not quite sure I forgive you for being a person who would do that thing. Does that make sense? I'm going to need some head nods because I can only see eyes. I think in in our understanding of how God works, we get it. He died on the cross, paid our debt. But did that death on the cross say to me, I am worth redeeming. He can make me into something new every day. And again, we're reminded from Psalm 51, yes, indeed, we are born into sin. Yes, indeed, we are broken people. But that is not God's will for us, people of God. He doesn't just leave us there. He doesn't just wipe the slate clean and just say, oh, look at all these broken people. No, he says, look at these people that I'm slowly healing and fixing with my Holy Spirit, making them new again. This also is the good news in Christ. The psalmist says, I also learned that there's something important about letting go. If God can let go, I've got to learn to let go too. God is already aware, not only of the deeds we have, but of who we are deep in our hearts. But when we let go, when we confess, when we tell God what we've seen and we experienced, it brings our awareness of where God is working and growing us. Confession is our way out of the chaos that feels like those swirling waters that the psalmist talks about. Those waters that seem to be coming higher and higher. Confession says, God, I need you. God, I'm sorry. Save me. Help me. And the psalmist says, this is the good news. His hand was already there reaching to pull us out of the chaos. After the psalmist shares the heaviness of keeping silent, 
he tells us what he's continuing to learn, the sanctification that's going on in his life. Here's what God is teaching me, the psalmist says, and it's all good news. First thing, God's not going to leave me to my own devices. He continues to instruct me and teach me in the way that I should go. He will counsel me and watch over me, and that's the work of the Holy Spirit, and that's the good news that all of us can share today. That's the story we can all tell. And he says, we're not animals. We're not like horses and donkeys that need bit and bridle to remind us which direction to go. No, we're teachable. We're moldable. We're renewable. We have the capacity to grow and learn, and that is good news, because that growth pushes back on the shame response. And he says, we have reason to rejoice because every one of us here is a walking testimony of how God is working to make us new creatures, to die to ourselves and to live into Christ. We're reminded in both of these Psalms that God provides a means for human nature to be changed. We have hope. Both our actions and our emotions and our desires and even our, yeah, thoughts that we can barely think ourselves can be redeemed. All of them are covered under the blood of Christ. They're engaged in the process of being made new, becoming holy, set apart, people who can reflect God's glory. Why? Because it's a part of his mission in the world. He wants us to reflect his glory and to invite others into the good relationship with him. So here's the invitation. Don't wait. Don't wait. Don't be like me when I had pain here and ended up having pain there and there and there because I thought it'll go away. Don't be like King David trying to fix everything on your own because we don't have the capacity. Only God does. Don't wait. Jesus is all about invitation, arms open wide, knocking at the door, asking to come in. Don't wait. That's the important part of why we, as Reformed Christians, say confession should be a part of our prayer all the time. Why? Not because we think we're such terrible, shameful people. No, because this is our way of being totally open in front of a God who's continuing to grow us to be more and more like Jesus. If we don't have that pattern, we all know we quickly come under the illusion that we're not in need of it. If we stop saying, God, here's some of the things that, I've, that I did today that disappointed you and hurted others, that hurt you and, and, yeah, damaged others. If we don't do that on a regular basis, it piles up and we forget how much we need to have a clean heart, a renewed spirit. So there's a healthy rhythm of examine that the psalmist calls us into, examining our days, examining our motives. Again, not because we're such dour people, but because we want the joy of our salvation. We want to experience that grace. That's why we review the Ten Commandments regularly, the ten best ways to live. Why? Because God's given us cadence and a way to interact with his world. That works well. And don't wait to shed the shame. Shame is rife in our culture. We hear about all different ways that we shame each other on Facebook, on Twitter. We see behavior. I'm, I'm quick to do it too. I'm in the middle of Costco and somebody's got their mask hanging down here. I'm like, what's the worth? You know? We want to shame people. We want, there's something in our culture that wants to make others feel bad when we see them not doing what we want them to do. It doesn't work. It doesn't work. It's the exact opposite of grace. Grace says, I'm going to pray for that person. Maybe it's really hard for him or her to have that mask on. I'm going to live into love rather than into ridicule. Shame is rife in our culture right now because we're in the middle of pandemic and anxiety. We need to shed the shame and lean into grace. We can extend good news if we can learn how to stop modeling what it means to make others feel bad and start modeling the joy of our salvation.
That's what we're invited into today. The joy of our salvation. We have a story to tell. I encourage you to tell that story and invite others in to be able to run the race without the shackles of shame and sin holding them back. That's what we're made to do. Praise God. He's given us a way to be able to do it. Will you pray with me? Gracious Heavenly Father, we, we thank you so much for your son Jesus. We thank you that he left behind a comforter and one who can live, reside in our hearts and do the housekeeping that needs to happen there. God, help us to hear your invitation to lean into the joy of salvation, to have the hand that sometimes feel heavy turn around and lift us up, become the hiding place that many of us need right now. God, help us to share the good work that you are doing both in us as individuals and, individuals and collectively. We pray this in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Leslie. Shed the sin, shed the shame, and live into the joy of our salvation. Let's, we're going to sing about that in a, a new song, a song called Yet Not I, But Through Christ in Me. And uh, this is a song on our church Spotify playlist. And you will read a little bit more about what Spotify is, if it's something you're interested in. I'm going to work with Evelyn to get something in our newsletter uh, for next week. But um, yeah, so uh, let these words just wash over your hearts. And if you want to stand, feel free to stand. If you want to sit and listen and close your eyes and reflect, that is awesome as well. So let's... Uh, Learn the song.
But in Christ, receive now his blessing. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance on you and give you peace. And all God's people everywhere said, Amen. If you're here for the first time in person, we have an exit strategy. Um, so that side will exit first from the back to the front. And when they have left, then the, this section, section two, can leave in the same fashion. And then section three. Um, so go in peace and uh, be blessed this week. <laughs>